Pedro el Cruel, Pedro el Justiciero, es complicado. Uh, my name is Anali Guzman. I'm from the East, and I will be proud to I'll be I'll be pleased to be presenting this. Es complicado. He was a complicated man. His reign was a complicated one, and uh, with and he well, I will just go from here, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, let me just now go to the go to the next slide. Okay. Pedro Cruel, uh, born 1334, died 1369. One of the prime examples of how history is written by the winner, how Pedro I of Castilla compares with Richard III of England. Both were involved in dynastic civil wars. Their oppositions employed slanderous propaganda to bolster their causes, and both were killed in the course of those wars and the history of their reigns written by their usurpers chroniclers in the beginning. Um, how Pedro I contrasts with Henry VIII of England. Pedro had more mistresses than wives, had nine bastard children, and recognized two to succeed him. Henry VIII had more wives than mistresses, had one bastard son, one legitimate son, and two daughters who were declared bastards later, but were placed in the line of succession after their legitimate brother. And to give you an idea of how he was presented over time. I'm putting the sources up on this page because it's a list of apologists, detractors, and their unbook titles. Uh, the first one, the uh, by Manuel ba Barrios Gutierrez, Pedro el Cruel, la nobleza contra su rey, uh, Pedro the Cruel, the nobility against its king. You can definitely tell the, the slant that that book is going to have. It won't exactly be a favorable slant, but it shows that he was not really that cruel. Uh, it's just that when his uh, half brother usurped him, he was gonna make sure that uh, his memory, that his uh, the deceased king's memory was going to be tainted in the public eye in, to be in, and then to have that support be thrown to him instead. Uh, Clara Estal, Esto or Estal, uh, Pedro the Cruel of Castile, 1350 to 1369 is the year of his reign. He only reigned for 19 years and they were tumultuous years for the most part. But she has a more even handed approach, uh, basically saying, yes, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't cruel, but he wasn't a saint either. Um, Again, and, and this, and then there are a couple of uh, websites that I have that are linked to some of my sources. Um, O'Callaghan, A History of Medieval Spain. This is the gentleman who kind of introduced me to Pedro, so I, I include him here. Storer, Edward Storer, Peter the Cruel, The Life of the Notorious Don Pedro of Castile, together with an account, an account of his relations with the famous Maria de Padilla. This was written in 1911 with all of the overblown language of the turn of the century, of post, uh, post Victorian turn of the last century uh, flavor. And I'm going to give you a, uh, an account of one of the, a chapter called Peter's First Murder. I mean, it's salacious. It's definitely on the slant of, yes, this was a horrible human being. Um, let's see. Uh, there, from Peter's first mur murder. Uh, from the queen mother who disgusted with her one excursion into melodrama or jealous perhaps of her son's possible usurp usurpation of her ghastly role or simply moved perhaps by simple human pity, Garci learnt that he must let nothing on earth bring him to the palace on the morrow Sunday. Those are the actual words of the old chronicler Ayala who lived at the time and saw many of those things with his own eyes. How like a sentence from Grimm's or Anderson's fairy tales they sound. The visit that must never be made, the apple that must never be eaten, the dress never by any chance to be worn. And yet, as we read it, we know well enough that the dreadful thing is going to happen, that the visit will be made, the apple will be eaten, and the fatal, fatal habit donned. So it was with Garcilaso. I mean, that's the kind of language this particular book had, basically saying, yes, this is Peter the Cruel, not uh, Peter, Pedro el, Just, uh, not Pedro el Justiciero. Uh, and so and then we go to the different chroniclers and how and why they flavored their account, accounts as they did. 
uh, contemporary chroniclers of the time, Pedro Lopez de Ayala, was the grand chancellor in Pedro's reign, who later defected to the, the opposing house of Trastamara. He ended up doing for the latter house what Shakespeare ultimately did for the Tudor dynasty, painting the predecessor in a bad light to legitimize the new dynasty in the public eye. And then you had Geoffrey Chaucer, whose patron was John of Gaunt of the, of the House of Lancaster and, he, and a political ally of Pedro. So his uh, writings of him when he mentions him are going to portray him in a more sympathetic light. And so the next one, Jean, Jean Frossart, the French chronicler, poet, and historian, whose monarch would be an, uh, an ally of Enrique, Count of the House of Trastamara, the opposing house. And the, and the Moorish uh, person whose writings we know of Peter from that time, of Pedro from that time, Ibn Khaldun, traveler, historian, philosopher, economist, and sociologist of 14th century Granada, who lived as a guest at Pedro's court in Sevilla and traveled back and forth between the two kingdom, many kingdoms many times. So now let me go to the next screen. Let me get to, actually, let me get to the actual slideshow. I'm not doing this right. Slideshow. Okay, so play from current slide. Here we go. All right, so, ah, here we go. And so I'm gonna click now to the next screen. Oh, I went too fast. Darn it, how do I go back? How do I go back? Shoot. I don't See, by clicking on your back arrows, it should make. Uh, what? Where do I find the back arrows on this? Like on your screen? keyboard? Oh, okay. If I can go to it. Yes, thank you. All right. Let me go back one. Oh, okay. I did not skip that. Okay. The Sins of the Father, Alfonso XI. This is the, a genealogy of the Royal House of Castilla at the time. Now, look in the middle. Look in the middle here. Alfonso XI of Castilla who marries Maria de Portugal uh, of the house of the house of, she, basically she was the daughter of the King of Portugal. Look at who, look at, look to his, look to the, uh, to look to the other lady next to him, Leonor de Guzman, and all those illegitimate children, uh, all those Ill illegitimate children uh, that they, that she had with him. That is basically the source of all the, all the all of all of the drama and all of what's going to be happening afterwards um the root of the tragedy is here the sins of the father uh, and the central cast of characters of that tragedy alfonso the 11th of the house of ivrea he was of less than average height and slight of build of light strawberry blonde hair he made up for that he made up for his at less than average height and slight build for build in valor on the battlefield and he had a very bellicose disposition he would do things his way or no way uh leonor de guzman no relation the long-term mistress she was a widowed noblewoman of intelligence who often advised the king on political matters she would give him 10 children 11 of whom would the eight of whom who would live to adulthood this is the start of the house of trastamara Maria de Portugal from the royal house of that kingdom, the aggrieved queen consort of Alfonso XI. He married her the same year he had met and fallen in love with, El with Leonor. He abandons her company for Le Leonor after she has provided him with one living legitimate heir. But she, but, and, and she has had to live with year upon year of humiliation as she is basically shut away from court and his, and his mistress is basically queen in all but name. And she's going to remember that. She provided, he pro, she provided him with one legitimate heir, Pedro, who was born the same year as Leonor's twin sons, Enrique and Fadrique, the former who would become the Count of, Tra, of the House of Trastamara and later depose his half-brother becoming Enrique II. This statue of, of uh, Pedro um, was made actually sometime after his death. Uh, apparently some people had figured we didn't quite do right by this man, we should remember him. Uh, and, and this is a lovely, uh, a, rather lovely a rather lovely statue of him, which is actually at the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid. 
And then we have, and, and Pedro resembled his father. He was slightly taller, but also of slight build and of, of strawberry blonde hair. Um, and this is Enrique. And you could see he also got the strawberry blonde hair from that family, from, from, uh, from that family. Maria de Padilla, a noblewoman with whom El Rey Don Pedro will fall in love, though he was already pledged to marry Blanche de Bourbon, daughter of the Duke of Bourbon, whom he will abandon to live with Maria immediately after the wedding, or, or shortly after the wedding. So next. The son repeats the sins of the father only more so. Uh, the board is set. Alfonso XI has Gibraltar under siege in 1350, but the Black Death roars through the encampment and he succumbs to it. His son Pedro is in Sevilla at the time. He is declared king, but he is struck with debilitating fevers. He survives, however, it is said through the intercession of the Virgin Mary. While Pedro was convalescing though, several powerful houses had contended in the background for the crown, some allying themselves with the house of Trastamara, the families of the bastard half-brothers, some going so far as to plan proposing marriage to the queen mother, who was the daughter of Alfonso IV of Portugal. This does not go unnoticed and is remembered when the king recovers in 1351, or actually shortly before 1351. In 1351, while he is in progress in Burgos, Pedro has the adelantado, the provincial governor, Garcilaso de la Vega, killed. His chief crime being that he had allied himself with one of these houses, the Laras. After de la Vega was arrested and shriven by a priest, Pedro orders him killed with a mace, and his body is thrown into an arena where a bullfight is going on, celebrating the king's arrival. You can imagine how the bulls treated the body. The remains were laid out on a bier on the city's ramparts as an example and a warning, uh, and a warning. So Pedro's mother, Maria, the queen mother, exacts her revenge on Leonor and has her imprisoned and killed in that same year. The majority of the house of Trastamara in the interests of avoiding open war while a plague is still going on, reconciles with the king and initially serves him. 1351 also sees negotiations concluded with the Duke of Bourbon to marry Pedro with the Duke's daughter Blanche, said contract brokered by Maria and Don Juan Alonso de Albuquerque, who had married into the Meneses family and their ties to the Portuguese throne. And the pieces move. In 1352, before, before he is set to marry Blanche de Bourbon, Pedro meets Doña Maria de Padilla, a noblewoman, and falls in love with her. He would later claim they married in secret. This map is of the Iberian Peninsula in 1350, and those lines that you see in there are Pedro's itinerary in 1352. He was a very hands-on king. He didn't just sit around. He went to as he had many progresses when he wasn't fighting wars. He was in many progresses basically promulgating, making many ordenamientos, many decrees to reform some excesses that were going on in both the clerical and the, the state of the, of the aristocracy. He was trying to centralize the government more and uh, basically cut down on a lot of excesses that were happening. And that didn't endear him to some of these people. Though there would be other women in Pedro's life, he would be largely devoted to Maria de Padilla for the rest of hers, eventually giving her four living children, Beatriz, who would become a nun at the Abbey of Santa Maria in Tordesillas, Constanza, who would, lay, who would marry John of, she would be the second wife of John of Gaunt, the first Duke of Lancaster, um, Isabel, who would marry Edmund of Langley, the first Duke of York, and Alfonso, their little brother, the Prince of Asturias, Pedro would convene the Cortes to recognize Alfonso as his heir, but he was a sickly child and would die months before his official recognition. That year uh, also 
Don Juan Alonso de Albuquerque rebels against Pedro. He had been the chief officer of Pedro's household when he was the heir, had become Pedro's chancellor major after his coronation, and broke with him over disagreements involving key appointments to various offices. Albuquerque allies with Pedro's half-brother Enrique, and they fight in Asturias, but they arrange a truce and an uneasy peace. Um, on June 3rd, 1353, Pedro marries Blanche de Bourbon, but he abandons her immediately to live with Maria de Padilla. He's basically treating Maria the way his father treated his mother. You'd think he would think about that, but no. It is said the marriage was never consummated. This alienates Pedro's mother and Albuquerque. They had brokered this marriage after all, and Albuquerque breaks with him again. And so... He didn't have too long, he didn't have, he didn't reign for too long before war rears its ugly head. Oop, wait a minute, what happened here? Uh, oh, okay, not yet. Uh, in 1354, Pedro imprisons his wife, Blanche, under the suspicion that she was aiding Albuquerque's rebellion against him financially. Meanwhile, Albuquerque dies under mysterious circumstances, and a growing number of nobles are becoming disaffected with the king. The presence of Maria de Padilla notwithstanding, he convinces Doña Juana de Castro, a widow from a higher ranking family than Maria, to marry him, likely to placate the growing number of nobles who object to his treatment of Blanche. He tells her that the marriage to Blanche was never consummated. He was likely looking to secure a legitimate successor, and she was of higher rank and station than de Padilla. He would abandon her as quickly as he had abandoned Blanche and return to Maria, but not before leaving Juana with a son named Juan the following year. In 1355, the queen mother allies with the twins, Enrique and Fadrique, against Pedro and actually imprison him in, in the city of Toro, but he escapes and convenes Cortes in Burgos and lays, and lays siege to Toro. Eventually, noblemen who had allied themselves with the brothers were arrested and executed without trial. Enrique flees to exile in France. Fadrique throws himself at the mercy of the king, surprisingly gets it, and his mother is allowed to return to Portugal, where she would remain until her death. And then war rears its ugly head. We have in 1356, the War of the Two Pedros. He goes, go, Pedro is going on progress to Conil and San Lucar. While in San Lucar, on a leisurely tuny fishing expedition, he witnesses nine armed galleys from the fleet of Aragon sail into the Castilian port while under the command of the Aragonese Admiral Francesc Peiros, loot two vessels and capture some of their crew. Pedro sends Peiros a message demanding the return Oh, and there's something, uh, we're demanding the return, there's, there's another thing I forgot to edit out, of the stolen cargo, which happened to be Genoese. Peiros refuses and, re and justifies the raid, claiming that Aragon was at war with Genoa. Pedro retaliates at once, arresting all Catalan merchants in Sevilla and confiscating their property. But letters fly between Pedro I of Castilla and Per, which is a way of saying Pedro, in Catalan, pair the pair, pair the ceremonious, uh, pero the fourth, pair the fourth the ceremonious of Aragon. He's also pair the third of Barcelona. This touches off the war of the two Pedros. P Pedro, unlike his, uh, Pedro, like his predecessors, was not immune to the temptation of military adventurism and territorial gain. Unlike his father and the and the majority of his of, of his ancestors, however. Reconquista did not beckon. He enjoyed good relations with the Kingdom of Granada. Uh, the, king, the King of Granada at the time was Mohammed V, who was almost of an age with Pedro, and they had met and had become friends. Uh, what he was, what Pedro was interested in, was redrawing the maps of the kingdoms of Castilla and Aragon to give him more access to the Mediterranean coast, since he only had 100 miles of shore there. Now, Pere the Fourth, the ceremonious, had allied himself with the French in their wars with the English, and Pedro the First of Castilla had allied with the English and had favorable trade agreements with the Genoese, who were in direct competition with Aragon. 
pair may have taken it may pair the fourth may have taken the advantage of political of the political situation in Castilla to stir things up, but Pedro equally had something to gain by open hostilities and was only too glad to oblige. A year into the war, in 1357, Pope Innocent VI arranges a temporary truce between the two kingdoms, but the war would drag on and off until Pedro's death and beyond, ending in 1375. Uh, more intrigues, more deaths. In 1357, while the war is raging, Pedro seduces Doña Aldonza Fernández Coronel, a widow who is also related to one of his political enemies. He installs her in the Torre de Oro in Sevilla, and it is said that many explosive letters were exchanged between her and Maria de Padilla. She repents of her conduct and moves in with her sister, son, with her sister, also named Maria, in Santa Ines. Unfortunately for Maria, her husband, Juan de la Cerda, deserts the king during the war, is apprehended, and is, and is to meet a traitor's death. Maria pleads for her husband's life, and Pedro, supposedly taken with her, issues a pardon. Unfortunately, in the many days it took for the letter to travel from Tarazona to Sevilla, the sentence is carried out. Pedro wastes no time in trying to seduce this sister, who is now herself a widow, but she'll have none of it. She goes so far as to reportedly splash her face with hot olive oil, disfiguring her beauty. At this time, Pedro's mother, back in Portugal, dies under mysterious circumstances, it is said poisoned by her own father as punishment for dalliances of her own, but there really is no proof of, it, proof of this. It's more than likely she died of the plague. Um, a lot of people did that, did back then, but it, it, was a, it, was good, it was good politics for someone to paint this as another mysterious death. She is eventually brought to Sevilla for burial in the Royal Monastery of San Clemente. On May, let's see, on May 19th, 1358, Pedro recalls his half-brother Fadrique to Sevilla after the latter, latter's triumphant capture of the city of Jomilla from Aragon. Unfortunately for Fadrique, his twin brother Enrique had declared himself an ally with the Aragonese. In Pedro's mind, it was a matter of time before he betrayed him. Fadrique, Fadrique expects a hero's welcome and goes first to pay his respects to Maria de Padilla. He senses from her manner that all was not well and tries to leave the palace. He is intercepted by two knights and brought before the king. He is set upon by Ballesteros and tries to defend himself, but fails to remove his sword from beneath his cloak in time. Pedro leaves to search for Fadrique's men as soon as he falls. The king finds one hiding in Maria de Padilla's quarters. When Pedro walks in, the man panics and grabs Beatriz, the king's daughter, to use her as a shield. Big mistake. The, uh, um, the, man, the cornered man yields to Pedro's order to release the child, then Pedro stabs him with his dagger. Returning to his own chambers, the king notices Fadrique is still alive and gives that same dagger to a page to administer the coup de grace. According to Ayala, after this was done, the king sat down to finish his dinner where the master lay dead. Fadrique died on May 24th. 1358. In 1359, Blanche de Bobon, remember her, is transferred as a prisoner to the Alcázar de Jerez de la Frontera, where she dies under mysterious circumstances in 1361. She was only 25 years old. Again, rumors say she, some say she was strangled, some say she was poisoned, some say her throat was cut. There's no clear conclusion. It could very well be that, uh, uh, you know, being in a be, being held prisoner for as long as she was, maybe a little, maybe it was a bad cold, whatever. She was only 25 years old. In 1360, at the end of April, Pedro lay siege to the city of Najera. He was on the verge of completing the siege and capturing his half-brother Enrique when he suddenly calls off the campaign. Enrique, Count of Trastamara, outnumbered and trapped, is inexplicably given the chance to escape, and he flees to Navarra. Pedro may have done this out of superstitious fear. The stories as to why he did this are largely apocryphal. 
Uh, he was told that um, he, he's, he was told different things by different people that as to do not do not kill your half brother. And he listened to them. This same year, he had his chief treasurer, Samuel Halevi, arrested, imprisoned and tortured on the grounds of embezzlement. He would die under torture and his family likewise imprisoned and put to, get to death. And you will notice, yes, that name, Samuel Halevi, the man was Jewish. Uh, Pedro had several Jewish people in positions of some influence. He would basically hire people based on their ability, no matter what their religion was. But that didn't make you safe, obviously, because look at what ha happened to Halevi. In 1361, not long after the death of Blanche, Maria de Padilla would herself die of natural causes. This was definitely attributed to either the plague or something very like it. Um, it was not a, it was, it was, it, there was no suspicion around it. And considering how he reacted after her death, he, he, he felt the loss deeply. He proclaims her queen of Castilla posthumously and gives her a royal burial with all attendant honors. Her body would first rest in the monetary, monastery of Santa Clara de Adustillo, Astudillo, but then be transferred to the royal chapel at the Cathedral of Sevilla the following year. A temporary peace. In January of 1361, Pedro leads a force of 6,000 knights against the Aragonese through Deza in the upper Ebro, where the, where the enemy has committed a smaller army. Anticipating a bloody clash, the papal legate steps up peace negotiations. Pedro, who seldom altered, altered or compromised any negotiating, negotiating positions, agrees abruptly to make concessions for the first time. Pedro and Per come to terms and sign the Treaty of Terrer, ratified on May 13, 1361. Pedro agrees to expel all Castilian exiles from Aragon and return for Pedro's promise to abandon all positions his army had captured. As a consequence of the peace, Pere Enrique goes to France, where he and his men enter the employ of several lords of Lang Languedoc. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, please forgive me. He makes a lot of allies there, lots of friends, and that will come back to uh, haunt Pe Pedro later. The reason for Pedro's abrupt halt to hostilities? His friend and ally, Muhammad V of Granada, had been overthrown, and Pedro felt vulnerable until his neighbor's situation was resolved. The Treaty of Terred did no more than reestablish the status quo of 1356. Pedro had proven he could muster the greatest military and naval force in the peninsula, but it failed to win a decisive victory. Succession issues. In 1362, before the Cortes, Pedro declares with witnesses that he had never consummated his marriage with Blanche, that he and Maria de Padilla, and he, that he and Maria de Padilla had married in secret before his wedding to Blanche, and that Maria's son Alfonso is by these reason the heir to his throne. Who were these witnesses? Diego Garcia de Padilla, Maria's brother, Juan Fernandez de Enestrosa, her deceased uncle, through a letter written before his death. Juan, Juan Alfonso de Mayorga, Pedro's chancellor of the Pri Privy Seal, and Juan Perez de Orduña, abbot of Santander, and the king's chaplain major. All lovely, impartial witnesses, I'm sure. Pedro is shoring up the succession against the claims of the Infante, the heir Ferran of Aragon, who is Pere's heir, and these, and they, and since all of these people are related, uh, many of them, all of them, almost tracing their uh, tracing their uh, ancestry back to Alfonso X of a century before, the Infante Alfonso dies on October 18th of that year. A month later, Pedro would revise his will for the second and what would be his last time. His oldest daughter Beatriz would be the first in line of succession, followed by her two sisters, unless she herself had heirs. Regicide as part of a long game. That same year, Pedro's forces do battle with Mohammed VI of Granada, called El Bermejo for his deep auburn hair. 
El Bermejo had overthrown Ismael II, his cousin and predecessor, who had in turn overthrown his half-brother, Muhammad V, a friend and ally of Pedro. El Bermejo travels to Sevilla, taking a fortune in jewels with him to sue for peace, trying to buy Pedro uh, as an ally, hoping Pedro will favor him as an ally instead. The treasure includes three large spinel rubies, 730 smaller stones, and pearls the size of hazelnuts and chickpeas. Muhammad VI is treated with honorable hospitality for two days. And on April 25th, 1362, the King of Granada and several members of his entourage are taken prisoner and put to death. Pedro's political goal was accomplished. On May 16th, 1362, his friend Mohammed V is restored to the throne of Granada. Castilla is given renewed support for the suspended war with Aragon and hostilities resume. Uh, a particular account of that murder, Pedro, for once, Pedro did the deed himself. He threw a, it, it is said he threw a javelin at Mohammed VI, at Mohammed VI. And so we go to the next page. Uh, we have here, in 1363, according to Ayala's Chronicles, uh, Pedro fathers a son by Doña Isabel de Sandoval. He is, he is named Sancho, and Pedro creates him Lord of Vienna, granting him several properties. He would have two brothers, Diego and Juan, all with the surname of de Castilla. But, and by the way, three years later, he also fathers a daughter by Teresa de Ayala, his chronicler's niece. And I'm wondering how much of that was an incentive to go to the other side. Uh, the, the daughter is named Maria de Castilla, who with her mother eventually had long careers in the convent of Santo Domingo el Real in Toledo. In 1363, he also accuses of the crime of les, I, I forgive my French, Les Majeste, fancy word for treason, those vassals who have allied themselves with El Conde Enrique El Bastardo. Um, in 1365, Enrique is gathering allies and provisions in France for a war against his half brother. This time he means business. In 1366, he enters Castilla via Navarra and with a large foreign force arrives at Calahorra proclaiming himself king of Castilla and Leon. This is war. He means business. He's going for, for everything. The Second Battle of Najera and the Aftermath. In 1367, Pedro trounces the forces of Enrique outside the city of Najera again. Pedro has English mercenaries on his side. Enrique has French and Aragonese. Pedro's most notable ally is Edward the Black Prince, and you can see his standard, the Edward the Black Prince's standard here. And uh, Pedro is uh, this gentleman over here, and then we have the forces of Enrique on this side, brazenly carrying the uh, Castilian and Leonese flag. Trastamara flees once again to France and comes back to Castilla with a small portion of the White Company. The war drags on. Enrique's forces resort to guerrilla tactics since they don't dare face Edward's forces in open battle. Edward eventually breaks off with Pedro though to, to, due to unpaid debts, which uh, another big mistake on, uh, on his part, another, another big mistake. Surprise attack, betrayal and death at Montiel. On March 14, 1369, Pedro's forces are surprised by Enrique's French mercenaries who had come in on a night march and Pedro is forced to seek refuge in the fortress of Montiel. Since Montiel was not provisioned well enough to handle a long siege, Pedro seeks to purchase his freedom from the French. On March 23rd, he makes his way on horseback to the quarters of Bertrand de Gusclan with other knights who were to mediate. He is betrayed there. Uh, as a fully armed Enrique enters the tent, he agrees to match and exceed Pedro's offer of ransom. The two half brothers fight, and Enrique takes out his dagger and stabs Pedro to death. Mano a mano, 
the French chronicler Froissart used the occasion to offer his own colorful rendition of the, of the event. He wrote about this after the fact. He relates that when Enrique entered the tent, he demanded to know where is that Jewish son of a whore who calls himself the King of Castile? To which Pedro replied, you are the son of a whore. I'm the true son of good King Alfonso. After this exchange, the half brothers of course come to grips. Pedro wrestled Enrique to the ground and was on the point of killing him when the Viscount of Rocaberti intervened. Pedro lost his advantage, was overturned and Enrique finished him off. Frossart ends his account with the following words. So ended King Peter of Castile, who once had reigned in great prosperity. Those who had killed him left him lying on the ground for three days, which in my opinion was an inhumane thing to do. And the Spaniards came and mocked him. So Pedro el Justiciero. Now we're going to the accounts of him in a more, in, in, in a less bloodthirsty light. Uh, stories of justice administered and deferred and a multicultural palace. The account of the old, a lot of these are apocryphal, but they appear more than once. And so in from different sources. So anything that appears more than once I included. And there's one story that I left out, which I may, which I may relate later, uh, but I left out because time issues and the fact that that one had conflicting accounts of where it took place. The account of the old woman with the lantern. In 1354, uh, in the city of Sevilla, in a twisted alley near the marketplace, a duel took place in the, in the small hours. An old woman with a lantern opened her window because she heard the struggle and saw a man on the ground in his death throes, another man standing over him with a sword. She saw, she saw the face of the killer clearly, dropped her lantern onto the street, which shattered, and she closed her window too in terror. The authorities investigated the murder. She was brought before the magistrate of the city when the lantern was identified as hers. When she refused to identify the killer, she was threatened with torture, to which she responded, it was the king who killed that man. At that moment, King Pedro, who was among the onlookers in disguise, advanced to the witnesses amid the stunned silence of the courtroom, took out a bag of 100 gold coins, handed it to her and said, this woman has told the truth. Heaven protects and justice defends those who tell the truth. Go then in peace and fear nothing. As for me, I did kill that man, but only God can judge a king. To administer justice in this case, Pedro had his personal artisan make an effigy of his head as a condemned man and put it on the corner where the duel had taken place. An ordenamiento, this is an example of one of his decrees, an ordenamiento, a decree against those clergy who were lacking in the obligations of their estates. Among other things, this 1534 decree obligated clergymen to not ask for tithes outside of their respective parishes or jurisdictions and enjoined known and hidden barraganas, mistresses of clergy from dressing in fine embroidered clothing under penalty of having said clothes taken from them or be fined 120 maravedis, which was no small amount in those days. Many of Pedro's decrees sought to centralize power and keep the aristocracy from abusing their positions which did not endear him to that arist to said aristocracy. The third story, the prebendary, the cordwainer and the king. In the city of Sevilla in the early 1350s, a prebendary commissioned a shoemaker to make a fine pair of shoes for the Easter procession. This was done, but days, weeks, months went by and the shoemaker had not been paid. No messages answered. The shoemaker's patience was at an end. He accosted the clergyman as he was leaving the mass, leaving mass and demanded his payment. The prebendary had a cane with him, so he beat the shoemaker soundly enough to basically disable him. When the case was brought before the king, since this was a, was a matter which involved the clergy, Pedro decreed that the prebendary could not take part in or officiate mass for one year. This was not enough for the shoemaker who, once he had recovered, had the clergyman beaten as badly as he had been. So of course it didn't take long to figure out who did this. And so he was brought before the court. 
Ordinarily, laying violent hands on a clergyman was a hanging offense. But Pedro decreed in turn that the shoemaker would be kept from making shoes for one year, stating that sentences for the same crime should be equal no matter who commits the crime. And uh, quite a noteworthy verdict and verdict in that case, quite a noteworthy sentence. And this is one that is hard fact, the defense of the Jews of Toledo. In 1355, during the war, Enrique's troops targeted the lesser Jewish neighborhood of Toledo, the Alcana, killing up to 1,200 people, men and women, old and young. This is Alaya, uh, this is from Alaya's Chronicles, and he might have exaggerated the number for, for effect, but a lot of people had been killed. Some knights of Pedro's army helped the Jews and also defended the Juderia Mayor, the larger neighborhood. Pedro gave his treasurer, Samuel Halevi, this was of course before they're falling out. Pedro gave his treasurer, Samuel Halevi, permission to build a synagogue as recompense for the, la for the sack of the Al Alcana. La Sinagoga del Transito was completed in 1357. It is now the Sephardic Museum of Toledo. You can see the gorgeous work done here. Uh, I, I visited that, I visited that uh, museum before it, be, before it became the Sephardic Museum. It was just a museum of that particular um, synagogue. Um, they added more things to it, restored more of it. Uh, a couple of years after I had left, I have to return to see what they did, did with it. Jumping in to give you your 15 minute that. warning. Oh, thank you. The Al okay, I got to go here. The, Al the Alcázar of Sevilla. In 1364, the Alcázar of Sevilla was completed. Pedro had no lack of enemies, but he also had allies. One of those, Mohammed of Granada. They were only five years apart, had come into their kingdoms at the ages of 16 and 15, respectively. Both were fascinated by architecture. Ibn Khaldun, a polymath of Granada, was often a guest of Pedro's court, as was the Sultan's Grand Vizier, Ibn Khatib. Evidence of the Moorish presence in architecture is plentiful on the Iberian Peninsula, where East met West and often merged. Pedro took the remains of an old Moorish Sultan's residence, restored and added to it, making, making it uh, one of the most singular palaces of, Christ, of Christendom. Nowhere else would you see an Arabic, um, an Arabic description an inscription dedicated to a Christian king on the doorway to said king's private quarters. Glory to our Lord, King Don Pedro. May God aid him. It's gorgeous. So, propaganda. When the news of Pedro's murder reaches Sevilla, the Jewish and Moorish neighborhoods there go into mourning. It is easy for Enrique, now El Rey Don Enrique el Segundo, to put forth an image of Pedro as an ennobler of Jews and Moors to alienate Christians from the memory of his half-brother. In reality, Pedro did not act too differently from any of his predecessors. It was in the interest of the crown to safeguard the welfare of these communities, not for their own sake, but for their ability to function as independent and direct sources of services and income to the king. From this point forward, that tenuous service relationship deteriorates, culminating in anti-Jewish riots in Sevilla in 1391, which would in turn lead to mass conversions, laws prohibiting conversos from holding positions of financial or civic responsibility, the limpieza de sangre laws, la inquisición, and ultimately the decree of expulsion in 1492. Geoffrey Chaucer eulogizes Pedro in the monk's tale. I'm gonna read it in modern English. O, o noble worthy Pedro, glory of Spain, whom fortune held so high in majesty, well up men your, thy piteous death complain, out of, out, of thy, out of thy land thy brother made thee flee, and after at a siege by subtlety thou were betrayed, you were betrayed and, laid, and led unto his tent, where he with his own hands slew thee, succeeding in your reign and in your rent. In the legacies, two fractious houses united. In 1387, Pedro's daughter Constanza and her husband John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, pretender to the English throne, along with their two daughters and a fully equipped English army, land on the shores of Galicia. They enter La Coruña without a fight and are welcomed in most areas. This is an image from Frossart's chronicle showing the surrender of Santiago de Compostela to the Duke's retinue. And there is Constanza. Const Constanza. 
Leon and Castilla offer more resistance since Juan I, the oldest son and heir of Enrique, and there he is with the reddish, with the reddish blonde hair, uh, ordered the Castilian forces to stay in their stay their positions and not offer battle. Resistance consists of defending well-provisioned forces. The invading armies had not brought cannon or siege equipment and experienced difficulties provisioning and paying their troops. The campaign stops. In the end, Lancaster. In the end, Lancaster and Juan come, come to terms. In return for giving up all claims to the Castilian throne, Juan compensates Lancaster and Constanza with financial concessions and offers the, matter, the marriage of his son and heir, named Enrique, to one of their daughters, Catalina. This is Catalina's uh, funeral, eff funeral effigy in, in, at her tomb in, in Toledo. And this is, Juan, this is Enrique III that uh, the heir to Juan the first. The resulting union of the future Enrique III and Catalina of Lancaster, granddaughter of Pedro, ends all challenges to the legitimacy of the Tostamaran usurpation. Their son, Juan II, equally shares the blood of the bitter fraternal rivals, Pedro and Enrique. And I include these two lovely pictures. This is of the ceiling of the synagogue of El Transito the lovely wooden paneling there. And this is the ceiling of the Hall of the Ambassadors of the Alcázar in Sevilla. Uh, and you can see the lovely uh, Moorish influence there. What we have after here, just all of the list of all of the sources of all of the illustrations. So I did my due copyright diligences. Um, and so uh, if there's time for questions, I'm happy to field them. Yes, we have about five to 10 minutes. Uh, that was wonderful. Very, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> it was a lot to unpack. <laughs> yes, very, very. Um, yeah. uh, anybody in any participants have any questions? Feel free to, to raise your hand or unmute yourselves. I wanted to say how fascinating it all was and thank you so much for your talk. <laughs> You're welcome. It's, uh, I'm sorry, I, had, I, rushed it a, I rushed it a little at the end, I do apologize. But, uh, but there was a lot to do and I left one thing out. I mean, if, I'm waiting for, I'll, if there's any questions, I'll leave the one story, I'll tell the one story out that I had left out because of conflicting, story, of conflicting sources of where it took place. But uh, any questions? <laughs> but, uh, well, I will go on. The one story that I left out is the story of how he picked a judge. And I left it out because some, some sources say it happened in Sevilla, and some sources say it happened in Toro. Um, there, was a par uh, there was apparently a one of those two cities was in need of filling in the position of a judge. And so there were three likely candidates there were three likely candidates uh, once, a lot, once all the others had been winnowed out for whatever reason. Pedro brought those three likely candidates to a fountain um, that used to be the, fount the, the bath where a Moorish, the Moorish would have their ablutions before their prayers. And so in that fountain, there looked like there were six oranges. There were six oranges, uh, six orange spheres were floating in the in that in that pool in that fountain and he says to the judges how many oranges do you see there each one he says to one how many oranges do you see one he says i see six oranges your majesty they're all very puzzled this is too easy the second one says i also see six oranges the third the third one tilts his head a little bit and he says may i go into the pool your majesty and he smiles, Peter, Pedro smiles a little bit and says, you may. So the man takes off his shoes, takes off his hose, goes into the fountain, takes out orange halves. It turned, they were orange halves. And he puts the orange halves together at the edge of the, at the edge of the fountain and says, there were three oranges in this fountain, your majesty. And the gentleman's name was supposedly Pineda, um, either Pineda or Mineda. And he says, and, the, and he happened to be the head of one of the local merchant, 
merchant consortiums uh, in that city. And he says, you are my next judge because I needed someone who could examine all factors in a case before rendering a decision. And so that's, that was the story I left out, but I figured it was worth including. Um, so, and that is the story of Pedro el Cruel, Pedro el Justiciero. It was complicated. 